Look at how pretty those flowers are. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go up to children's regular and make sure you don't touch them, okay? It's just, it's just the way God made you. <laughs> happy Sabbath, happy Easter. Feliz Semana Santa. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad to welcome our streaming audience. This is a very special day. And you knew that because you just looked at this beautiful platform and you could tell that we're pulling out all the stops to celebrate the death burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. I want to invite Heidi, Heidi Medina, to come up. She has an important announcement to share with you. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. There we go. So it's been a while since we've talked about our food donation at two a week that we do at this church. In the little cupboard right underneath the picture of Jesus in the foyer, um, we collect food for um, donating to different food banks. It's had a different locations through its history, but we are still doing that. Um, I'm the one that collects the food. I used to come by Friday after work, and um, we sometimes we give it to the Genesis Center. Sometimes I put it in some of these little um, box cabinets you see around town, blessing boxes, and so forth. And several times lately, one of the elders has come up to me and said there's been a need locally, and I'll put together a bag of food for that. So just to kind of put it before the church, what we need are non-perishable food items, and it's great to take advantage of some of the BOGOs like at Publix where they've got the soups, um, the, the canned like ravioli, pastas, the boxed macaroni and cheeses or, you know, hamburger helpers, things like that. It needs to be non-perishable because sometimes the things don't get distributed immediately, things like crackers and so forth. But I know I've had some people tell me they do a buy one, get one, keep one from the self, give one. Some people say I don't have a lot of storage space, so I get something for me and something to donate. But we are still doing the food donation. We, things were, we were getting quite a bit up through the holiday. It's been a little lighter in the cabinet since the holiday. So just to kind of refresh that we do have that ministry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Elizabeth, come on up. By the way, if you like mangoes, there is an important sign-up for mangoes out in the foyer. If you don't like mangoes, come see me. I'll pray for you. Good morning. I am up here. I know a lot of you, like myself, are last minuteers. This is the very last minute for the auction dinner tickets. Look, at, see, I have all these tickets. The with your name on it, or they can because I have a pen, right? And I also brought a lovely assistant up here to show you an example of what a garden party attire looks like. So see me or Jen afterwards, and we'll get you your ticket. Thanks. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to that event. I hope you will support it as well. You know, one of our elders had a very significant day this past Thursday, and I'm talking about Don McClendon. Don has retired. Woo! And, and I want to tell you, I'm so proud of you, Don. Don has been a faithful teacher and administrator for many, many years. And I believe, Don, that Jesus right now is looking down from his throne and saying, 
well done, thou good and faithful servant. This church and all of our members really value and believe in Adventist education. And I think this is such a very, very important event. I want us to affirm Dawn for her faithfulness, for her loving service to the church, to students, and to Jesus. Let's affirm her with a round of applause right now. Thank you so much, Dawn. We are just so very, very pleased. By the way, we had a wonderful Taste Fest this year, and we had many wonderful cooks. And if you did not get a cookbook, we want to make sure you get one. Just see Miriam Parham. Our speaker today is chaplain, head chaplain, Andres Seguera. And I've asked him to speak. He has an incredibly powerful message to share with you today. And he is an elder of this church. And he also does something that m some of you know, but many of you don't know. And that is, most Sabbaths, he translates the sermons into Spanish. And so our non-English speakers can hear the Word of God. And let me tell you, I've worked with Andres. He has the gift of translation. It is truly a spiritual gift. So thank you for your faithful, faithful service. Tomorrow morning, we will continue our celebration of Easter. And so at 8 o'clock in this very room, we will have a wonderful, wonderful service. Uh, last night was very, very special. Uh, those that were here just really loved the service. And we didn't do a lot of singing last night. We focused on preaching the word concerning the, the messages, the seven messages that were heard around the cross. But tomorrow morning, there will be a lot of singing. And so I need your voice. I need your voices. So please come out tomorrow at 8 o'clock, and then we will enjoy breaking bread together. We will have a, a brunch uh, put on as a fundraiser by the Pathfinders. We've, we've just really, really have enjoyed this whole Easter series. Anyway, let's pray as we begin our worship service. Lord in heaven, Words cannot even begin or attempt to express how we feel about your sacrifice, how we feel about what you've accomplished and have done on our behalf. But Lord, may your Holy Spirit translate those feelings. May he put into words those feelings so that we can affirm you and tell you from the depths of our hearts how much we love you how much we appreciate you, and how much we enjoy following you. So, Lord, bless us today on this high Sabbath. For this we pray in the powerful and beautiful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And all the people said...
2, verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The book of Acts tells of the account of early church in its infancy. It was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and thousands came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Ordinary people like you and I engaged in missional lifestyle. They did whatever was necessary to see the work move forward. They taught, they fellowshiped, ate and prayed together. Many sold their possessions and gave to anyone in need. This community is the movement. This community, this movement gained favor among the people and God added to their number daily. I want that kind of community, don't you? Today's offering for our local church is for our local church. Let's do whatever we can to bless our church family and its mission to our community. Let us pray. Lord, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to be a church that rightly represents you as we love each other and our community around us. Help us to live out your mission. We give you all we are and all we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The offering will be collected at the end of the service. Time for children's story, but you know what you do? If you don't have a little container like what Miss Jane has got up here, you can come get one. And then you need those, the rest of you that don't know, we, we give money to help children come to Christian education. Oh, there's some more right here. If you grab it right there and wave those dollars high so they can see it and come and get it. Or those fives, tens, twenties, hundreds, whatever you want to give. Oh, I'm so sorry, you okay? Get your shoe back on. I still see some dollars being handed out. When you come up, sit on the bottom look row here and on the floor, right in front of these men that are sitting on the... Oh, Joe, I need you closer. Joe, why don't you stand and sit here, Joe? You can sit on the floor right in front of the bottom row, okay? We've got so many flowers on the front, that's good. It's time to come forward. That's great. You guys are doing great. Thank you. Good morning, boys and girls. Are you ready for story? Let's sit down. It's time to start our story. Happy Easter. Oh, do I have your ears? Okay. This morning I'm telling you a story about Joe. Joe was 12 years old, but he was very big for his size. But Joe had some interesting challenges. He had a hard time walking. He couldn't walk very like the rest of the kids as well. So sports were hard for him. And Joe, 
he, he had a hard time learning. School was so very difficult. In fact, he had a hard time even speaking. Sometimes he could speak clearly, but at other times. And sometimes he would make sounds that would kind of disrupt classes. So Joe was specially challenged. But, so that meant he had to stay back with some of the younger kids. But he loved Sabbath school. He would come to Sabbath school and he said, oh, Miss Day, he was happy to be there. And Miss Day would kind of wonder if he was catching things. Well, the kids, it was springtime and Easter was coming the very next weekend, just like what we're celebrating. And so Miss Jay told a story about why we celebrate great, great, um, Easter. She told all about Jesus. She wondered if Joe was understanding. But then she says, boys and girls, I have an assignment for you. I'm going to give you an egg just like this. And I want you to fill it up with something that talks about new life, that shows new life. She wondered if Joe was understanding. And she meant to call his parents during the week, but she forgot. So the kids come back in. They put all their eggs back in the basket when they came in to Sabbath school, and they were so excited. They couldn't wait until the teacher shared their egg. And so the teacher said, Good morning, boys and girls. Let's look at what you found in your eggs so she opened up the first one. Oh, I wonder what it is a little blue egg what kind of egg is that it's a robin's yes somebody said a robin's egg she found a robin's egg why yes that does represent new life because when that egg hatches it will have a new baby bird Oh, the next one she opened up. Oh, it had a butterfly, a butterfly. Oh, my goodness. Look at those butterflies. Why, you know, a butterfly has a little cocoon, and the little cocoon turns into a butterfly. That definitely represents new life, she said. Very good, kids. Oh, let's see what's in this one. Oh, oh. It's a flower. Yes, of course. When the flowers come up from the ground, that's new life. Or when they bloom on a, tr on a bush, definitely new life. All right, she opened up the next one. Oh, it's empty. Oh, it must be Joey's. He must not have understood. I'll put it right back in the thing. I'll start to, oh, I'll open up this one. She didn't want to embarrass Joey. But all of a sudden, as she started to open up the next one, Miss J, what are, why are you not talking about my egg? Why didn't you talk about mine? And, and she says, well, Joey, it's empty. He says, yes, it's the tomb. Jesus is alive. He's no longer there. And you know what? Miss J started to cry. Joey understood the true meaning of Easter. Amen. It is all about Jesus. He gave us new life. Amen. And I'm going to say a prayer, and then I'm going to just tell you something before you go back to your seat. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the new life, the new life that you give us because you were crucified on the cross and you were raised again. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now at the end of the service, if your mom or daddy approves, you can go get Miss something sweet from Miss Jane at the back of the service, but it's at the end of the service, so listen really carefully to the sermon. You can go back to your seats.
morning. Happy Sabbath. We serve such an amazing God. He's our miracle worker. He's our way maker. Please help us sing.
this time we take the moment to talk to Jesus. You know, God loves when we can talk to him because he invites us to do that. He says, ask, seek, and knock. And even before we begin to pray, he's willing and ready to answer our prayers. Do you have burdens on your hearts? Do you have joyful moments you want to rejoice about? Let's talk to Jesus about it. Lord, you are holy, holy, holy. And we are here today because we want to see you high and lifted up, high above the heavens, O oh Lord, because that is where you should be, even though you are right here in our midst, in our hearts. This morning, Lord, we come before you. We praise you for all your goodness, just for who you are. But we also thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have given us throughout this week. We thank you for the opportunity to work. We thank you, Lord, for placing people in our lives. Some challenge us, but some are there to encourage us when we feel down. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we can eat. We can have food on our tables. We thank you for so many things, Lord. Today we are here and there are many among us, O oh Lord, who are not so well, not doing so good. Even though we come and with a smile on our face, we say, Happy Sabbath. Many of us are struggling. We are struggling, Lord, in our finances. We lift those up before you. There are among us, O oh Lord, people who are struggling in their relationships. We lift that up before you. There are many among us, Lord, who are physically ill. We place those, your great physician, in your care. There are many of us who are mentally struggling. And all of us, O oh Lord, spiritually are weak and are needing of your help and your grace. Bless us all today. We come, O oh Lord, to worship you and we pray that as we have been doing that this morning, the, the songs uh, that are lifting our, our voices and our hearts to heaven. We pray, Lord, that at the end of today's service, we can say, man, church was good today because we have been with Jesus. We also pray for Chaplain Andres as he prepares to share from his heart what you have placed on his lips. I pray, Lord, that as you speak to him and through him, that you may speak to each and every heart this morning. Some of us need a little encouragement. And some of us need a little shaking up. Whatever is there for us, O oh Lord, may your word inspire us so that we can move forward. Our desire, Lord, is to draw closer and closer to you each day. So we pray for our neighborhood right here in Zephyr Hills. Lord, I pray for those online who are watching or worshiping with us online. Bless them as well and their families and their households. Bless this community. Bless this city. Bless this state. Bless this country. Bless our planet. Lord, we can't wait to see you. We eagerly wait for you. But until then, O oh Lord, until you come, give us a song in our hearts to cheer us and keep us faithful. Thank you, Lord, for today's service. Thank you for the invitation to worship you. We bless you, we love you, and we praise you for who you are and for what you do. We pray these things in the loving name of Jesus, the one who we celebrate this weekend for the gift of Calvary. Amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. 
Can you imagine any of us being here if Jesus hadn't done what he did? I pray that you'll be blessed.
Haven't you been blessed with the music? I want to thank the choir, and Chris, our children, and all that have participated this morning in this worship experience. Bow your heads with me, please. <clears throat> Loving Father, we are so uh, thankful to be able to come to worship you on this day. It's a blessed Sabbath, and it's kind of a high Sabbath because of Easter. We have come to listen to your word, but I pray that you will enable us to listen to you even in the silence. We pray for your presence to lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. So as many of you know, and if you didn't know, you just heard it, I'm a hospital chaplain. One of the surprising things that any chaplain can tell you that we have learned during training is how to tolerate silence, which means a couple of things. One of them is uh, the discipline of being quiet, as well as being comfortable enough when others are quiet. Sometimes our ministry as, as chaplains in the presence of suffering is best described by show up and shut up. <laughs> Calvin Coolidge was president of the United States and he used to see dozens of people every day in his office most had complaints of one kind or another, and he received another visitor, a special visitor, one of the governors came, and he couldn't understand how Coolidge could see so many people. He said, you finish with them by dinner time, whereas I'm often at my desk till midnight. 
Yes, said the president, but that's because you talk back. <clears throat> Another interesting vignette comes from uh, Casey Stengel, who was a longtime Major League Baseball manager, whose unique way with the English language became known as Stengelese. Uh, he is told to have held a position on the board of directors of a California bank. According to a story that originally appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Stengel described his duties this way. There ain't nothing to it. You go into the fancy meeting room and you just sit there and never open your yap. As long as you don't say nothing, they don't know whether you're smart or dumb. <clears throat> and you know that after the first service today, somebody said that for fish, that's especially true. You keep your mouth closed and stay out of trouble. But have you noticed that Jesus could keep silence when others wished he would have used his eloquence to defend himself, like when he silenced his opponents, the Pharisees, in more than one occasion? Christ's power and humility is revealed in his ability to be quiet. And this was predicted, actually, in the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah, we all know or have heard of this uh, very well-known uh, chapter of the suffering Messiah. So, uh, verses 4, 5, and 7 tells us that he suffered the things we should have suffered. He took on himself the pain that should have been ours. But we thought God was punishing him. We thought God was wounding him and making him suffer. But the servant was pierced because we had sinned. He was crushed because we had done what was evil. He was punished to make us whole again. His wounds have healed us. He was treated badly and made to suffer, but he did not open his mouth. He was led away like a lamb to be killed. And just as sheep are silent while their wool is being cut off, in the same way, he did not open his mouth. So this was not just prophetic uh, oracle that we're listening to here. That was actually a reality. And, and for those of us who love music, and I think everybody loves music, in most compositions, uh, there are silences. Silences mark uh, the flow of music. And a dramatic pause uh, many times can uh, stir the soul and captivate the senses. Now, the visual arts also impress us. Back in 1983, when I was in seminary, I got to watch the final episode of that popular show, MASH. And I'm sure that there's probably a few fans here. And there was a couple of uh, scenes that really grabbed my attention uh, and, and my emotions. In one of them, a Korean woman tries to quiet her crying baby while she's hiding with a number of American military personnel inside of a bus that's being surrounded by enemy troops. So the American surgeon Hawkeye, the star of the show, approaches the distraught woman that had the crying baby only to find out that she had smothered the baby to avoid tragedy for the rest of the group. This shocks him to the point that he becomes temporarily insane. That was a cruel and deafening kind of silence. We hear much about the sayings of Jesus. I think Jesus' gift was to speak the right word at the right time. We have heard during this uh, weekend here at church about the sayings of the people around the cross. But maybe we haven't taken note of the silences of Jesus during this same time. 
his refusal to answer some questions and his meekness on the face of false accusations and abuse make his sacrifice all the more powerful. Like dramatic pauses in a beautiful musical piece, his message was clear and resounding. He who could have silenced his, the, the argument of his accusers chose to let his life of loving service and his sinless conduct speak for him about his commitment to save lost humanity from their sins and thus reveal God's true character of righteousness and compassion. He let his record speak for him. And so I'd like to bring up to your attention a couple of these instances in Scripture here in the New Testament. Before the Jewish council, if we could switch to the next one, when he was facing his judgment under strange circumstances, it was nighttime, he was being harassed, during the, the, during the process. And so we could see the humility of the Lamb of God here in Mark chapter 14. It says, Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. Yet even their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. That's pretty amazing. Then the next phase of his judgment, uh, we see him before Pilate, who was the uh, Roman envoy to that area, as well as in front of Herod. And so, if we could see the next one. From Mark chapter 15, it tells us that very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole council made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. And then the chief priests accused him of many things. So Pilate asked him again, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Interesting reaction. Now, before Herod, it was a different story. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied with him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. And as we read the story, we realize that Herod then became very upset and started with uh, having uh, some of the guards around to mock Jesus and to uh, mistreat him. So perhaps there's a lesson for us in all of this. Scripture tells us in Ecclesiastes that there is a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. So let me mention something to you about the pause. In the medical environment, uh, since a few years ago, there's something called the pause that has been practiced. It is defined as 30 to 45 seconds of silence immediately after the death of a patient to honor his or her life and to distinctly mark the importance of the moment at hand. It is a brief timeout that allows everyone involved in the events leading up to the death of the patient to collect their thoughts, to reflect, and maybe to bring some closure. Beyond that, it's also a brief moment to acknowledge the tremendous effort and care offered 
by this healthcare team to the patient. Now, this is not done in every hospital, but uh, wherever it is practiced, the results are significant. Typically, uh, the clinical staff will quickly disseminate because they have work to do. And they basically shove their feelings down under the surface, and, and that can cause problems in time. So this is kind of a way of acknowledging the dignity of this person, the fact that he or she didn't come to the hospital to die. And they have a family, and they have a story. And it's a way to recognize that. Now, about the most poignant pause in the passion of Jesus, which is after his death, I want us to consider a passage here from Luke, chapter 23, and verses 52 to 56. Going to Pilate, Joseph asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb caught in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. Although this was the silence of death, there is deep meaning in it for us. I want to read uh, a paragraph from the Desire of Ages as our prophet weighs in on this. At last Jesus was at rest. The long day of shame and torture was ended. As the last rays of the setting sun ushered in the Sabbath, the Son of God lay in quietude in Joseph's tomb. His work completed, his hands folded in peace, he rested through the sacred hours of the Sabbath day. In the beginning, the Father and the Son had rested upon the Sabbath after their work of creation. When the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, the Creator and all heavenly beings rejoiced in contemplation of the glorious scene. The morning stars sang together and all the angels of God shouted for joy. But now, after the burial of Jesus, he rested from the work of redemption. And though there was grief among those who loved him on earth, yet there was joy in heaven. Glorious to the eyes of heavenly beings was the promise of the future a restored creation, a redeemed race. This was the result to flow from Christ's completed work. His work is perfect, tells the scripture, and everything God does will endure forever. <clears throat> so what is the meaning of Jesus' Sabbath rest in Joseph's tomb? How does it benefit us, and what does it teach us? <clears throat> Well, perhaps we need to look at another passage. And I want to invite you to look in your Bibles or in your Bible app, uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. So the context of that passage is uh, the story of Israel's disobedience in the wilderness, which was nothing but distrust in God's capacity and willingness to meet their needs to keep them alive and safe. It was essentially an act of rebellion that spoke of their deep doubts about God's love and their ignorance about his character as a noble, trustworthy father. So we're going to read verses 6 through 11. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. 
This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Now, you may have noticed that this is not really a passage about the Sabbath. It is, it is a deep demonstration of how the Sabbath represents, besides a day of rest, it represents the completion of God's work on behalf of humanity. And how we enter into rest as we become unloaded of our burden of sin. So here the Sabbath means faith in a Savior who died to save us and trust in his promises of final redemption and even of daily provision and a love covenant relationship that results in obedience. And yes, keeping the seventh day Sabbath is a witness of our trust in God's completed work of redemption in Jesus. It means ceasing from our works and trusting in his work. You see the difference? So the other scene from that final MASH episode that struck me was the moment when the ceasefire begins. The surgical team is working to save what could be the last group of wounded soldiers and civilians in that uh, long and grueling deployment in Korea, when suddenly the radio announcer gives a heads up that in one minute the ceasefire should go into effect. You know that these events are marked by date and hour. As the shooting and the bombing dies down, everybody waits quietly and expectantly, as though hanging on to hope that the fighting would end. And then the announcer says, there it is. That's the sound of peace. Creation and redemption are both marked by divine pauses. God's act of resting invites us to do the same, to be still and know that I am God, as it tells us in Psalm 46.10. Christ's completed and effective saving work brings restful peace to our restless lives, otherwise burdened by sin. You should have received a connection card, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, looking on the back where it says my next step today, and maybe we can read this together. And you can check those things that you feel that you want to commit to, and then you can turn it in along with the offerings in a few minutes. The first says, I recognize the amazing love that drove Jesus Christ to sacrifice his life for me on the cross, and I celebrate the results of his resurrection in my life. Secondly, I love Jesus for his life-giving words in Scripture and stand amazed at his silence under duress and abuse during his passion. Thirdly, I long to learn the value of silence as a sign of trust in God when words seem inadequate to express my feelings of loss or suffering. And then if you'd like to receive information or becoming a member here, or if you'd like to join a disciple-making small group. Now, as we wind this down, in contrast to the quiet in Joseph's tomb during those 24 hours of stillness, 
The sounds and sights that followed early on the next day are now much more memorable. And I'd like for us to read from Matthew chapter 28, the first seven verses. I think we're familiar with this story, and yet it's powerful to read it again. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. If it is true that at the time of creation the morning stars sang together and all the angels of God shouted for joy, on this glorious resurrection morning, as people have been known to say, the party was on. My dear friends, because of the resurrection, we can look forward to being at the, part, at the celebration of redemption, which will take place before the throne of God, as is recorded in Revelation chapter 19, verses 5 and 7, where it tells us, Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. What do you say to that? This is why we commemorate this weekend, because we can look forward with confidence to that glorious reunion. May you and I be there. Amen. Amen.
May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. Amen. Amen. May you be seated for the postlude.